يا نبي سلام عليك يا رسول سلام عليك يا نبي سلام عليك يا رسول سلام عليك Our next speaker for this evening is Brother Zafar Bangash, Brother Society of York Region. He is the Imam at the Islamic Society of York Region's Mosque and Community Center in Richmond Hill. Brother Zafar is a former editor of Crescent International News Magazine and a trustee and former assistant director of the Muslim Institute in London where he worked with Dr. Kaleem Sindiqi, the founder of the Muslim. He is best known for his commentaries on current affairs while he was the editor of Crescent International. Although he has stepped down as editor since joining the ICIT, he continues as a columnist and contributor to Crescent. At this point, I would like to invite our respected guest, Brother Zafar, to the stage. Please welcome him with a loud salawat. Auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahi rahmanir rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا وخاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأهل بيته التيبين الطاهرين وأصحاب المنتجبين اللهم صل على محمد وآل Respected ulama, sisters and brothers in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Unfortunately, we live in very troubled times. We face many challenges, but I'm glad that uh, you brothers and sisters have decided to organize a program on the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad so that Muslims can be brought together on the one personality that unites all of us. I know that there are very serious attempts being made all over the world in order to divide Muslims. These attempts are externally directed as well as internally directed. I think we should be very honest about this fact. <clears throat> but before I start off, I'd like to make two requests. And that is, the first, this applies to all of us. Uh, I think uh, what we should do is um, leave our prejudices outside the door. We should come with open minds and open hearts. Secondly, I would request all of you that whenever uh, we discuss any issues, often what happens is that we tend to concentrate more on the secondary sources of Islam rather than the primary sources. If we were to remain close to the primary sources of Islam, which is of course the Quran, and the Sunnah and the Seerah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I think we would avoid a lot of difficulties that we face in the world. With respect to the message of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Humma Salli Ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, when he proclaimed his message in Makkah, it obviously evoked two kinds of responses from the people. The positive response was from those that were oppressed in society, also women, because women were also oppressed in society, and predominantly youth of society. And there was of course also a negative reaction. And the negative reaction came from the power wielders, the privileged class, the exploiters, the oppressors. And I don't think anything has changed throughout history. This is in fact 
the entire history that we can encapsulate. But I'd like to also point out to the fact that it is one of the most inspiring aspects that the first person to accept Islam was a woman, Khadija radiallahu anha, the beloved wife of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the first person to die for Islam was also a woman, Sumayya, the wife of Yasir. So you see that although Muslims are often accused of oppressing their women, but we find that a woman becomes the first person to accept Islam. And of course, she happens to be the wife of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, we know that between spouses, there is absolutely no hijab. The spouses, you know, your wives or your husbands know everything about you. And therefore, they can be the real judges of your character. And then, of course, the first person to die for Islam was a woman as well. There are a number of other people as well. And I also want to identify the names of the individuals that were harshest in their criticism and opposition to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These were people like Utbah ibn Rabia, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'eed, Abu Sufyan, Umayya ibn Khalaf, Abu Jahal, and Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab happened to be an uncle of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you can see that when people's personal interests get involved, they don't even care about family, family relationships over there. And of course, the years of oppression that occurred in Mecca ultimately forced the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to leave Mecca and to migrate to Medina called Yathrib at the time. And I want to emphasize that it wasn't a voluntary exit from Mecca. The Meccan chiefs had plotted to kill the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he had to flee in order to save his life and of course the mission that he was entrusted with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he arrived in Medina, <clears throat> again this, this is related to the subject matter of our uh, discussion today, unity, that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa uh, first of all laid the foundations of Masjid al-Nabawi, a very humble structure at the time. And he personally participated in its construction. Uh, he did not feel that just because he's the messenger of Allah that somehow he is superior to those people around him or that he should supervise and they should work. No, subhanallah, the noble messenger of Allah worked with his own blessed hands, putting bricks over there and building the masjid. Secondly, he realized that if the penniless and the destitute muhajirun that have come from Mecca uh, were left on their own. Uh, the people of Medina are going to get tired of them very soon because these people had come penniless. And of course, you know, people's um, generosity has limits. You can see around the world wherever uh, refugees have gone into other countries, how they face difficulties because very soon the host community tires out of the refugees. So what the Prophet ﷺ did was to link every muhajir with one member of the Ansar so that there was a bond of brotherhood that was created. And that bond of brotherhood was a master stroke of ingenuity because the responsibility uh, was shared equally now. And of course soon once the, the, the Muhajirs from Makkah were able to uh, establish uh, themselves, that they were able to uh, work on their own and not be a burden on their uh, Ansar brothers. But even broader than that, in terms of unity and in terms of leadership qualities, uh, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
offer to the people of Medina what is referred to as the covenant of Medina, Mithaq al Medina. And in fact, there are copies of the book available outside, and I would um, hope that uh, you will, inshallah, get some copies. <clears throat> I want to move quickly because I want to come to the present time and see what we, ha we should be able to do or what we ought to be doing. There were a number of challenges that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam faced in Medina. Uh, life wasn't easy even in Medina. Of course, the challenge from the Quraysh who kept on attacking Medina and they carried out many attacks on Medina. Um, in the covenant of Medina, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had given the rights to all the people that resided in Medina, whether they were Muslims, non-Muslims, or even Jews that resided over there. And in fact, the Jews were given special rights within the covenant of Medina because they were considered to be people of the book. And yet, regrettably, at every step of the way, the Jewish tribes of Medina violated their covenant agreement with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, they even plotted to kill him. And then, as you know from your history, that um, during the Battle of uh, Ahzab or Battle of Khandak, that they even broke their covenant agreement with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and were prepared to commit treason and for which of course the, the leaders of the Banu Quraiza were then punished. And then of course outside you had the Persian and Roman empires. But the greatest challenge that the Muslims faced in Medina was from the Munafiks, the hypocrites. I mean actually the word hypocrite does not accurately convey the negative connotation of munafik that is in the Arabic language. Now it is one of the most curious things and I'll tell you something, I've been doing a lot of research into the seerah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when you ask any Muslim and even any scholar, uh, they will of course immediately mention Abdullah ibn Ubay as the chief of the munafiks. But what is really curious is that we know that prior to the battle of Uhud, 300 people led by Abdullah ibn Ubay broke away from the Muslims. That means 300 people that claim to be Muslims broke away from the Muslims. Now I've been searching and searching in the Sira books and I cannot find the names of more than three or four people of those Munafiks. So what happened to the names of the other 296 Munafiks that were with Abdullah ibn Ubay? And I think if we investigate this, I think we would find that what happened after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is exactly related to the Munafiks that we don't know about. You see, even today in the Muslim world, you find people that have Muslim names, carry great titles, Khadim al Haraman, and this and that. But I don't think that they're any different than the Munafiks that existed at the time of the Prophet. ﷺ. That is the reality that we face today. And, you know, as it was mentioned earlier, regrettably, we have gone, we are actually living in a period of Jahiliya. We call, most of us, we call ourselves Muslims, but in actual fact, we practice very little of Islam. What does the Quran say? This is what the Quran says in, in Surah Fatha. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Muhammadur Rasulullah wa lazina ma'ahu ashidda'u ala al kuffari ruhama ubaynahum. That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah and those who are with him are harsh towards the kuffar and kind and compassionate towards each other. And what do we find in the world today? We have so-called Muslims that are much harsher towards Muslims than they are towards the Kuffar. They have alliances with the Zionists, they have alliances with the imperialists, but when it comes to Muslims, oh, they start dishing out fatwas of takfir and kufr and so on, oh, you are kafir because you don't pray like me, you are kafir because you don't believe in my ideology, etc. Subhanallah, I mean, these are people that call themselves Muslims. In fact, you know, if you study the Hadith literature, even in the Sunni sources in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, there are more than 50 Ahadith in which the Prophet has expressly forbidden 
Muslims to declare takfir against other Muslims. This is what the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us. He said, any person who simply recites the kalima, his honor, his property, and his life become sacrosanct with Allah. And yet, what do we find? I mean, this is all, you can see it on videos, on internet, whatever. There are people that are actually slaughtering Muslims while the Muslims are reciting the kalima. They're actually slitting their throats. So what kind of Muslims are these? These people are even worse than the jahils of the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But I want to move forward and I want to come to our present situation. And I'll, I'll sort of share a couple of things with you uh, that are very inspirational. And these are aspects of practical steps towards uh, Muslim unity. In 1963, uh, Imam Khomeini rahmullah, had gone for Hajj and he found out that uh, Maulana Madudi from Pakistan had also come for Hajj. And Imam Khomeini made a specific effort to go and visit Maulana Madudi, and they had a long and detailed discussion about the affairs of the world. Maulana Madudi received the Imam with graciousness and of course with all the love and affection that is due to a great scholar and, and a, an Imam. But the Imam had the humility to go and visit Maulana Madudi. This is well known, this is documented. In fact, it's, you know, Wali Nasr has written it in his book as well. But there's something that I'm going to share with you that is not written in any book because it's my personal experience. In August of 1979, Maulana Madudi was in the US. He was ill. Uh, his son, uh, Dr. Uh, Farooq uh, Haider, uh, had brought him to the US. He was living in Buffalo. And about a group of 20 or 25 of us uh, decided to go and visit Maulana Madudi in Buffalo. And I asked him, when I went to see him, that I would like to record your interview. And he refused. He said, no, you cannot. Uh, after, of course, a lot of discussion, we agreed, uh, or he agreed, that I can record his interview and I've taken my tape recorder with me. He said, on one condition, that you will not publish it in your newspaper. So I said, okay. That's why I say that what I'm going to write to you was not published in a newspaper. So in, during our discussion, I asked him about the Islamic revolution in Iran. And this is what Maulana Madudi said. He said, I pray to Allah that he would give Imam Khomeini and the Islamic revolution at least one year in order to consolidate themselves. This was on August the 4th, 1979. Just about a month before Maulana Madudi passed away. He died on September 22nd, 1979. And you would see that within exactly one year's time, on September 22nd, 1980, that Iran was attacked by, from Iraq, from the Ba'athist forces, and of course, the Confederacy of Kufr, led by the Arab regimes and so on. And of course, the entire imperialist world, led by the United States. A couple of other points, and that is that, um, in terms of practical steps towards Muslim unity, um, I believe two of the greatest scholars uh, outside Iran that have done a lot of work on the works of Imam Khomeini are Professor Hamid Algar, who is Professor of Near Eastern Studies at the University of California in Berkeley, and uh, the late Dr. Kaleem Siddiqui, who was my teacher and a great friend of mine as well, both Sunni scholars, but they are the ones that have done the greatest amount of work on the Islamic revolution and promoting uh, Muslim unity. I want to move forward to today. <clears throat> we face many challenges. Uh, in fact, um, I'm currently doing research on a book on the Saudi regime, uh, and, and I've got good news for you. Uh, the book is titled the doomed kingdom of the house of Saud. 
uh, inshallah, it is, it is heading towards oblivion. Uh, but what I discovered was that they are spending something like two to three billion dollars a year, two to three billion dollars a year in creating disunity among Muslims. And they've been doing it since 1975. So we do face formidable challenges. But, you know, one of the um, most important lessons that we understand from the seerah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he always gave hope to his followers. That he was always optimistic. And I'm going to share something with you that I've shared with my congregation in, at the at, the, at our center in Stowell or Richmond Hill. And this was that about 20 years ago, uh, scientists at the University of um, Philadelphia did an experiment with mice. And they took a batch of 20 mice and s split them into two batches. So they took one batch of mice of 10 and they put them in a huge water tank to see how long these mice will survive. So these mice, of course, swam and swam and swam and etc. They started to sort of, you know, drown at, at, the, at 47 minute, 48 minute. By 52 minutes, all of the mice had drowned, all 10 of them. Okay, so 10 mice wiped out in 52 minutes flat. Then they took another batch of mice, 10, put them in the water tank, and they took them out of the water tank by the 47th minute before the first mouse was about to drown. So they took these 10 mice out of the water tank. And they dried them up and let them rest and gave them a little bit of food, whatever, and put them back in the tank. You know how long these mice continue to swim? Can anybody guess? What happened? You know, these mice, the second batch of mice, continued to swim for 37 hours. 52 minutes compared to 37 hours. What was the difference? Hope. Now these mice were thinking, okay, guys, don't give up. I mean, you know, weren't we about to drown the last time and somebody came and pulled us out? And they took us, they dried us up and they gave us food and rested. They are bound to come. Maybe they've just gone to Tim Hortons or something, you know. <laughs> Hope is what made those mice survive for 37 hours. If mice can reach that level, brothers and sisters, what we can achieve with hope and optimism. That is what I say to all of you, that that is the message of the sunnah and the seerah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And that is the message that we should carry. We should never give up hope because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a lot of potential in all of us. Each and every one of you present over here is actually a winner. You know how? Biologically, when the sperm meets the egg, there are millions of sperms that are competing to reach the egg to fertilize it. The fastest and the strongest and the best sperm is the one that wins. It's the winner. And each one of you is the product of a winner. You've got it made up. You don't have to worry about anything. What we are really lacking is the imagination and the sincerity and the will. And I believe that even small numbers of Muslims can make a great deal of change in the world. What we have to do is to be focused, to be committed, and to have a directional course as the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam set up. So I hope and pray, inshallah, that we would have that vision and that character that builds societies. And I want to conclude with this, and of course I also want to make an announcement that inshallah we'll have uh, a program on Milad and Nabi at our center as well on Saturday, February the 14th. So that's Valentine's Day and we want to express our love for the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So please come and join us on that occasion.
And I want to leave you with this. You know, uh, the late Dr. Kaleem Siddiqui uh, once said that if the Sunnis were to be a little less Sunnis and the Shias were to be a little less Shias and both of us were to be a little more Muslims, I think it would be much further away. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Martyr for Islam. Yes. Yes. Salawat, please. The second question is how many billions of dollars is Saudi Arabia spending to spread disunity among Muslims? Yeah. Two to three billion. Can I have a salawat, please? Could I please request uh, Brother Shaquille to come up for the knot right this time? Thank you. <laughs>